Good evening, everyone. Uh, we're going to begin in just a few moments. Uh, we'll give people a couple of minutes to, or one minute to sign on, and then we will begin. All right, um, we are going to go ahead and get started. Uh, once again, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining the Hyde Park Kenwood Community Conference Forum on Food Security. My name is Ali Amora, and I am a board member with the Hyde Park Kenwood Community Conference, the organization that's hosting tonight's events. And I will be one of your MCs for the event tonight. Please note that this event is being recorded and live streamed on Facebook. Tonight's forum is a chance for all of us to come together as a community, to see one another, to see our neighbors, um, and to share how the, you know, we've been affected um, in the recent pandemic, particularly as it relates to food security. It's a chance for us to hear from our local leaders and community members and to get some of our questions answered. So I wanna thank everyone who is with us for taking the time to be with us tonight, um, including those of you who are joining us for the very first time. Welcome. Before we begin, I want to take a quick minute to tell you about our host organization, the Hyde Park Kenwood Community Conference, or HPKCC for short. HPKCC is an independent community organization that was founded in 1949, whose mission is to connect people in a diverse, green, and safe community. We convene groups and individuals to network and build community around multi generational activities, community resources, and major issues that affect our future. Throughout its 70 year history, HPKCC has organized committees and task, force, task forces to deal with timely issues. The continuing goal of HPKCC is to meet the needs of an ever changing community. HPKCC exists to support all of you. Over the past several months, HPKCC has held five community dialogues that attracted over hundreds of attendees on Zoom and received even more views on Facebook Live. You could view those recordings uh, on HPKCC's YouTube channel. Tonight's community dialogue on food security is a continuation of the community building and information sharing that occurred during our first four events. We encourage everyone to visit our website, www.hydepark.org to become a member of our organization and sign up to receive updates. I'm now gonna run through our schedule for this evening. Uh, first, we'll have a brief welcome message from HPKCC president, um, who will then introduce our speakers um, and who will provide us with an overview and information on food security. Third, we will end with a question and answer session. And a note on our Q&A, uh, tonight, uh, there are some questions that were provided for speakers um, in advance, so we will have a moderated discussion with the speakers for the first 10 to 15 minutes of the question and answer session. Then we'll open it up to audience members to ask questions directly to speakers. You can either put your question in the Zoom chat, or if you would like to uh, ask the question yourself, you can raise your hand in the Zoom app and you'll be called on to ask your question directly. Participants will be given one to two minutes to ask questions, and we cannot guarantee that we will get to all the questions, but we will do our best to get to as many as we can, time permitting. Uh, we are joined uh, by a special guest uh, tonight, Senator Robert Peters, um, who will uh, be speaking to us. We will have a Q&A following um, his uh, introductory remarks and um, if we don't get to your question during that Q&A portion, uh, then when we finish off our uh, session tonight with our main Q&A session, we'll get to you then. 
Uh, as a reminder for all of our participants, please remember that this is a public forum. Out of respect for all the participants, please use appropriate language and keep your questions and comments brief and to the topic at all times. Uh, HPKCC reserves the right to mute or remove participants for inappropriate comments or comments that don't relate to the topic at hand. As a reminder, we are both recording and live streaming this event on our Facebook page. Uh, so now I'd like to introduce HPKCC Board President, Phylan Crawford, uh, who will share a few words on behalf of the board um, and introduce our speakers. All right, Phylan. Good evening, can you hear me? We can hear you, we can't see you yet. All right, here, we, here I am. Good evening. I'm Phylan Crawford, president of the High Park Canwood Community Conference. Welcome to the continuation of our virtual community forums. Today's topic is food security. Food pantries are reporting a record number of visitors since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. Many of us take our access to food for granted. That is not the case for everyone. Food pantries are running out of food and school districts throughout Chicagoland are giving away meals by the thousands every day. We will learn from our guests tonight what food security is and get some helpful resources for people who are worried about having enough food to feed their families. Tonight's guests are our special guests of Senator Robert Peters, HPKCC member and sustainable development professional, Imahara Garcia, Dan Deckenbach from the Hyde Park Kenwood Food Pantry, and Connie Spring from Experimental Station. So I'd like to welcome our special guest for the evening, Senator Robert Peters. Is Senator Peters on the line? Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Welcome, Senator Peters. Thanks for joining us tonight. Definitely, thanks for having me. Okay, so it's a very important topic today. So please take about five minutes or so to talk to our audience about food security. And then we'll yeah, probably I mean, have a few I, questions for you. Okay. Um, you have I have the floor. Thank yes. you. Um, okay. So um, the first thing I will say is that, you know, when we talk about future food security, we talk about the fact that um, if we look early on at this pandemic, we saw how hard hit people were. Um, we saw the panic that people were going through. And so when I think about, you know, this pandemic, when I think about, you know, these three crises, I think it's not necessarily telling us anything new. Uh, it's telling us a lot of things that have existed for quite some time. And that is the fact that people have been struggling and hurting to get the basic things that they need uh, in this world for decades. Uh, and so when this pandemic hit, it sort of hit across different cross sections of, of life, uh, people struggling uh, to be able to keep their job, people struggling to be able to find the food that they need, people struggling to be able to, you know, find comfort in their, you know, in the, with the roof over their head. And so when I think about, you know, the food security crisis that we're in, I think about the fact that, you know, for 30 to 40 years, we've seen massive disinvestment in communities, especially across the South side. We've seen food deserts um, that have been crippling for people. And what that's led is people feeling like they are at limited resources uh, and panicking, rightfully so, because of the fact that we've seen such 30 years of, of disinvestment. So I always talk about public safety and I talk about dignity. Uh, and I talk about when we talk, you know, when we think about a public safety response to this world, it's not simply just having, you know, closed circuit television uh, on the corner or, you know, the police. Really, a safe community is the fact that you have affordable food and you're able to put that on your, your table and feed your kids. A community that does not have food is a community that is not safe. Uh, and so I think this is an important discussion. Um, it will allow us to dig deep into what it means to have, you know, when it comes to food insecurity and food security uh, and what it means in terms of this crisis. Uh, and I think that for my job is to fight. Um, you know, when we think about, uh, you know, almost every map of Chicago is the same. Every map of Chicago is the same map of Chicago. If you lay down the map of where 
people were, you know, experiencing the worst rates of COVID or healthcare disparities and people were experiencing food deserts and people experiencing, you know, crime, they're all kind of intertwined. And so I feel like my job is to fight to make sure that, you know, places like, you know, Experimental Station and the 61st Street um, uh, Market is getting, you know, the supports and the resources that they need, making sure that when, you know, South Shore uh, was experiencing a fear that they might lose uh, a new grocery store that I'm, you know, basically fighting and saying I'm going to demand that they have the things that they need. Uh, or when in Hyde Park, when we saw, for, you know, honestly, for most people, when we talk about Hyde Park, it's a rarity. It was actually a risk of being a, a food desert in terms of affordable food. You know, I know there was Whole Foods, but very affordable food. Uh, and Trader Joe's finally came in. So I think a lot of people, no matter what your age, no matter where you're from, understand that if they have food on their table, they're more likely to be in a safer place and a more comfortable place in their life. So that is something that I feel is, uh, you know, extremely important uh, and plays a key role in my worldview. Uh, and I think is an important part of us as we build and reimagine community post this crisis uh, and in the 21st century about making sure that we build around food security from grocery stores uh, to farmers markets uh, you know, and to making sure that people have fresh, good, good produce on their table. All right, very good. Okay. I'll well, take I any think... questions. Sure. Yeah. Uh, I'll start with one. Uh, Senator Peters, do you think there's kind of a social stigma attached to people using food pantries? I, I do think, you know, to be very honest with you, I think that there is a social stigma. Um, I think it's for people like me to push back on that stigma as much as possible. I think that when we look at food pantries and we look at food stamps, uh, we see sort of the image that, you know, I, I, I'm pretty political about this, but the image that Ronald Reagan really pushed on the sort of welfare queen, uh, you know, sort of racist trope. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, I think we need to do whatever we can to provide food for people, whether that's a food pantry or a grocery store or a farmer's market. Uh, I think it really requires us to look at, you know, link. Uh, I think it just, we have to make it so that people are able to get their food and not judge them for how they get it. Um, and not only that, considering this crisis, the fact that we are seeing our resources tightened, more people overwhelmed, food pantries were overwhelmed, you know, particularly early on. It just goes to show that it's for me to say, it's okay for you to go to a food pantry. And it's my job, you know, and I think for all of us in government and in governing power to say that let's make it so that we make food even more accessible for you. Uh, and that we don't actually have to necessarily just go to the food pantry route uh, that more people have grocery stores. All right, very good. Ali, go ahead. Yes, hi, Senator Peters. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Um, we have a uh, one of our participants um, has uh, raised her hand. Um, we are going to call on Philinda Wiley. Um, and so Philinda, we've. OK, if you could unmute yourself, there we go. All right, can you hear us, Philinda? All right, looks like we can't hear you. Mm. All right, we can we can we can work on getting Philinda to appear or be able to be heard. We can take one more question in the meantime, and then Philinda will get to you as soon as um, we take this one question. Our, I think Laura Staley is asking a question here, um, yes. which Let's is. See. I see okay. one on the chat. Let's see. Yes. Yeah, I can see one on the chat here. Let's see. Uh, Ms. Staley is asking, what can we as a society do to help people get the grocery items that are typically necessary for a family, but not covered by SNAP or WIC? Personal body products, diapers, paper goods, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, I mean it's a bigger conversation about how do we expand those services to cover um, you know, your sort of personal body uh, products. 
I also just think that that's something that we need to demand. Um, if we look at sort of the attacks on particularly SNAP and WIC, but the attacks on SNAP that have existed for quite some time, it's made it harder and harder for people. Uh, and what that does is it puts more of a reliance on, on organizations that also have limited amount of resources at the same time. So I think in all honesty, it's for us to break the um, sort of white rightward tilt against um, SNAP and WIC and government benefits. Uh, and that will help us expand, uh, you know, sort of the opportunities and the possibilities around government assisted programs. I think it goes back to that sort of first question um, in which we wanna sort of break the stigma uh, because that's, one, you know, one part to look at that is like, Breaking the stigma is is also a it, it is in itself a political uh, statement um, because of the attacks that have ha happened when it comes uh -huh. to being poor and food insecure uh, and it, being poor and not being able to get the uh, products that you need for your you know sort of your bodily health. Okay, let's see. All right, thank you. I think we I think Philinda, do we have? Is she? Are you on with us? Okay, do you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Welcome. Okay, thank you. My question was, do you have any encouragement for people to start their own gardens and to encourage each other to, the, to provide themselves fresh foods? Yeah, I mean, I can answer this. In a, it's a, it's a, um, this is a very complicated and complex way to, to answer this question. I think the idea of a community garden and community farming, I think is extremely important. In order for us to really drive that, we need to also change the way we do, uh, really, I think to put this best way, the cooperative economics around uh, community gardens and community food, um, because there's a lot of things that go into that to try and to not just be it specifically a few people who make it a hobby, but to make it sort of a uh, more collective economic space. Uh, and this will be particularly helpful uh, when I think about um, food deserts and, and black working class communities. So I, I think that would be helpful. I think that's something that needs to be considered. Um, I think that at the same time though, uh, you know, I, I think we still need a big, large scale um, food chain. That's not necessarily a horrible thing, um, just a well-regulated food chain and reducing stigmas around um, you know, where and how you get, you know, your products and where you, and how you get your goods is, I think, important. And I think it's a combination of both. So, because not everybody has necessarily their own individual garden. So, I think for a lot of folks, especially folks who are renting and building, having that community space, I think the fact that we have a, you know, high amount of vacant land, um, we don't need to always overdevelop on that vacant land. We can create some of this sort of community garden uh, community farming space combined with, um, you know, a way to interact with it so that all ages are able to, you know, sort of play and learn and uh, contribute to their well-being, I think is, is very important. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Ali, I see another question in the chat here. Again, it relates to community gardens. Um, do you think the city or the, probably the city, can they do anything to make it easier for people to start a community garden? Because it seems like there's a kind of a lot of hurdles to do that. Yeah, so I think to start a community garden, you're going to need the city and the aldermen to be very supportive uh, because they play an outsized role in sort of um, when it comes to local land. Um, if you're trying to do a community garden that feeds uh, you know, a lot of people, there's it, it, if you're going to do it for free, that's one thing. I think that there's a way in which financing it, those, you have to also interact with the state. Um, and so it depends on how large scale you want to be. Uh, so if it's just small and it's a few people and they're, you know, gardening and doing, it, I think this is supposed to be gardening and farming is my guess is in this question. So if you're doing that, um, most of that's going to be provided from your local elected official uh, at the municipal level. Okay, well, that's good for people to know. Yes, um, and we, we want we have, and I think just to, to, to clarify, we had a question from uh, Gloria Fallon and that I think was, we've already discussed um, with Violinda's with question. 
Um, and then we have another comment um, from Stephanie Franklin, um, who wants to uh, clarify um, or, or says, please clarify that the only benefit from SNAP is that SNAP recipients, I believe it's supposed to be, do not pay the sales taxes, but that it's not a program um, that discounts any any food prices. Um, so yeah, yeah, yeah. I I believe SNAP is subsidizing part of your food. So if I'm correct, you you actually get a, it's it's a it's a level of a subsidy to pay for groceries um, that's coming from the state uh, as well as the um, yeah from from the state and federal government. So. I, I'm pretty sure that is a, a, a subsidy, it's a subsidy to help pay for food. Um, if I'm I believe I'm correct on that. I mean, I, I was on SNAP about a decade ago, but I, that was, you know, that was a while ago. Um, so I'll double check, but I'm pretty sure it's a subsidy to help pay for food. An increasingly tightened subsidy and a very low subsidy. I mean, I barely got any money when I, uh, to help cover any costs. So, um, I believe that, yeah, I, I, I'm going to double check that, but I'm pretty sure. Thank you, Senator Peters. I think we have time for one more question. Um, and so if anyone wants to jump in with another question. I'll jump in okay? because I have a few questions on the subject, but uh, let's see. Uh, is there any way to address the uh, food shortages that are happening at food banks? Because it seems like it's becoming a bigger and bigger problem. Yeah, I mean, I, this, you know, I, I kind of mentioned this earlier. The, the problem is, you know, early on, we, the problem is I, I can talk forever. So you're going to get me to talk forever about this. When okay. right now we have to get really nerdy, we have a 50, possibly up to 50% real unemployment. Uh, and we had an immediate rush into the sort of unemployment uh, space. We're already at trouble when it comes to food banks, but we got particularly bad. Uh, around food or food pantries um, when, the, when the, the virus hit. So we had a rush of people who were unemployed combined with a rush of people who needed goods, uh, which led to you know, both food pantries and mutual aid programs to sort of spring up, uh, tr try to help folks. Um, and so I think that part of this crisis is, is, is a systemic among many lines. So it, it's not necessarily that we just only have limited resources when it comes to food pantries and mutual aid. The same, same thing of the fact, the same problem is that we also have high, high unemployment with uh, people who are, who have an in, instability in terms of their life. So with high unemployment, uh, food deserts, and combine that with limited resources in terms of donations, combine that with limited resources in terms of funding, I just feel like you just sort of hit like a, a, a tornado of our problem. So if we want to see ourselves sort of get out of this crisis, I mean, to be honest with you, one of the most frustrating things right now during this crisis has been the fact that the federal government doesn't really exist, it seems like. And what we really need is to you know, massively reduce our unemployment, get rid of unemployment would be ideal. Um, we need to you know, sort of create, we have to be able to create funding streams for people who need to use food pantries um, in terms of like the food pantries themselves, in terms of the resources that they need. We need grocery stores to pop up. We need people to make enough money to be able to afford the food that they need. I think the idea is that a food pantry is a last resort. Uh, and right now, I, I would say for most people, it's increasingly more of a first resort. Um, it's the first place they would go to. And so when you have a high, when you have a case of high unemployment and a place that was supposed to be a last resort becomes increasingly the first place to go to, that's going to be a crisis. Uh, and if we don't do anything now, it's going to extend longer and longer and get worse and worse. And to be honest with you, when you combine that all together, you create more and more unrest. And this is how these things all tie together. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Senator. Thank you. Yes, thank yeah. you, Senator. Yes. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, Phylin, I think we're going to move on to our panel. So um, uh, if you could, you would take over and introduce our speakers. Okay, first, uh, we'll introduce uh, Yumar Garcia. And as I said, uh, Ms. Garcia is an HPKCC member and a sustainable development professional. Ms. Garcia? 
please go ahead with your presentation. And unmute. Yes. There you go. All right. Thank you. Okay. Hi. Thank you so much, Filene. Well, You're first welcome. of all, good afternoon. I want to thank you all for being part of tonight's community forum. I am delighted to be here and talk about what food security is, why it matters to all of us, and just a spark up the conversation about building a more resilient food system. So let's begin. Um, I'm sure many of you have been wondering what is food security. So what's food security? Food security means that all people at all times have physical, social, and economic access to sufficient, safe, and nutritious food that meets their food preferences and their dietary needs for an active and healthy life. For a long time, it was believed that access to food was the only requirement for food security, but this concept has evolved up throughout the years to include other important components. So we have availability, which as, you, as we all have experienced now, Availability of food can be disrupted by any type of natural disasters, public health problems, including pandemics and catastrophic changes. Another important co concept of food security is utilization. This is referred to food that is properly prepared, stored, and people have an adequate knowledge of nutrition and childcare techniques. The flood of cheap calorie rich food in many of the communities has contributed to food insecurity by replacing traditional diets and crops with nutrition, with nutrient deficient types of foods. Another important component is stability. Access, utilization and availability must be considered over time. So stability looks at the resilience of a community's food supply and the effects of weather conditions, political instability, economic factors, and public health problems. Next slide, please. So I'm sure when you were listening to Senator Peters, you were all wondering what is a food desert? Well. Food deserts can be described as geographic areas where residents' access to affordable, healthy food options is restricted or non-existent due to the absence of grocery stores within convenient traveling distance. The map that you're seeing on your right is from a paper published in 2018 by researchers from the University of Chicago that shows the food cluster dynamics in Chicago. As you can tell, the neighborhoods marked in light red are the ones where people experience persistently low access and the ones in dark red map the neighborhoods that face extremely volatile access. As you can tell, most communities experiencing low and volatile access to foods are located in the south side. Well, there are a few areas where access to food has actually improved. These areas are marked in gray the challenge for the South Side remains. So now let's talk about the current situation in Chicago. Next slide, please. What is the current situation in Chicago? So we're gonna talk about a little bit uh, in regards to the data that has been collected, which hasn't been easy, but there are like a few organizations that have been conducting surveys and studies to kind of try to have like a better view of what's been happening during this pandemic. So before the outbreak, Feeding America estimated that 10% of Cook County residents were food insecure, including 12% of children, meaning they lack access at times to enough nutritious food for an active, healthy lifestyle. Food insecurity doubled overall and tripled among households with children in April 2020. 
relative to predicted food insecurity rates for March 2020 before the pandemic. Next slide, please. So in the Chicago Naperville Elgin metropolitan region, food insecurity rates jumped to 24% with African-American and Latino households disproportionately impacted. COVID-19 has only increased the importance of neighborhood food retailers in disinvested parts of American cities, just like the South side of Chicago, where many residents rely on poorly equipped carryouts, fast food outlets, and dollar stores for essential supplies. Next slide, please. So while the pandemic has created even more food insecurity, as unemployment and poverty ra rates have skyrocketed, placing the community at the center of food security and recognizing the power of the grassroots voices has emerged as a solid approach that will drive the transformation. So let me introduce you to a new concept. This concept is food sovereignty. What does it mean? It means that communities have the autonomy to define their own food systems contextualized within a community's cultural, traditional, political, and economic realities and traditions. Next slide, please. So this food sovereignty framework developed six main pillars of grassroots solutions that place communities at the center of the decision-making process. Let's take a look at each one of them. Next slide, please. The first component is that it focuses on food for people. The right to food, which is healthy and culturally appropriate is the basic demand underpinning food sovereignty. Guaranteeing it requires policies which support diversified food production in each region and country. Food is not simply another commodity to be traded or speculated on for profit. And I think we all experienced this during the pandemic because we all had to deal with long lines and we would have to go to the supermarkets and sometimes would not be able to find like main staple foods. So we really have to go back to the root of these issues and understand that this demand is a main basic right for people. Next slide, please. The second pillar is that it builds knowledge and skills. Number one is that it builds on traditional knowledge. What type of knowledge? Knowledge from small producers, small holders, knowledge from indigenous people and from people that belong to all the communities that have for years been growing their own food and that have preserved techniques along with like collecting all the knowledge they have around what type of crops can be grown in different regions and areas. It also uses research to support and pass this knowledge to future generations. Technology is an important part of it, but it has to be a technology that preserves the environment and does not undermine or contaminate local food systems. Next slide, please. What is the third pillar? That we work with nature. By working with nature, you optimize the contributions of ecosystems by implementing production and distribution systems that protect natural resources and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Senator Peters was mentioning about community gardens and the ability that some people have to grow some crops in their own gardens and to start organizing to do this at a community level so that we are not dependent on imports from other countries whenever we have risk situations and national emergencies like the pandemic. And it also improves resilience. Next slide, please. Number four is that it values food providers. 
support sustainable livelihood. What is this? Well, we all have seen all the important uh, initiatives that uh, the city of Chicago has had in the past, like supporting farmers markets, and by that making a direct connection between consumers and producers. What do we achieve by this? We respect the work of all food providers and assert food providers the right to live and work in dignity. Next slide, please. Another important pillar is that it localizes food systems. As I was mentioning before, it reduces the distance between food providers and consumers. What happens is that it resists dependency on remote and unaccountable corporations, which was mentioned before uh, by one of the, the people that were asking questions in the beginning. Like, as much as we love having all these different types of fruits and different crops in different access to, to these crops in different supermarkets, it is true that whenever emergency situations come up, we really have to find a way to build community resilience. Next slide, please. And the last pillar is very important. It puts control locally. Places control in the hands of local food providers. They can use them and share them socially and environmental sustainable ways which conserve diversity. We all, in order to build a resilient food system, we all need to understand the importance of conserving diversity. Another important point of this pillar is that it recognizes the need to inhabit and to share territories and to rely in people that for centuries and generations have preserved and lived in those communities. And the third is that it rejects the privatization of natural resources. The, the natural resources are seen as a public good, which is a right to all human beings regardless of their racial or socioeconomic status. So before I conclude with my presentation, I would really like to highlight that this pandemic is a defining moment for our food system. The opportunity to transform it is in our hands. Going local and acknowledging the need for community ownership and control of our food is at stake. I encourage all of us to think of ways to responding to this call for community action. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mahara. That was very interesting information and the slides were nice and colorful and made me hungry. So, okay. <laughs> okay, all right. Our next guest is gonna be uh, Jan Deckenbach from the Hyde Park Kenwood Food Pantry. Jan, are you there? Unmute yourself, please. Please. Okay, can, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Great, thank you very much. And good evening, everyone. Um, the Hyde Park Kenwood Food Pantry has been operating for about 40 years and right now is located in the Hyde Park Union Church. Um, <clears throat> but before I go into that, I would really like to shout out <clears throat> to other local food pantries because we are all in this work together. Um, the food pantry at St. Paul and the Redeemer Church Shirley Knight and her crew are amazing. And um, there's also a food pantry at First Presbyterian in Woodlawn. So, um, as well as food pantries in the surrounding area. Part of the problem that happened in the pandemic is about a third of the food pantries in Hyde Park, or in the Cook County, I should say, closed either by reasons of their um, 
their organizers or their volunteers being um, vulnerable or the buildings themselves closing, but all of a sudden, a lot of people had nowhere to go. And the Greater Chicago Food Depository, of which the food pantries I mentioned and our food pantry are members, leaped into action um, along with partners on the state federal and also corporate level. And the result was they started pushing out food at a tremendous rate in um, sealed uh, boxes of produce. And then another kind of box had protein, including frozen meat. And um, others were uh, dry goods. And this was great. It, but if you, if you want to get a lot of food to a lot of people at one time. And so you may remember the, the many pop-up pantries also that, that came when trucks um, would come with these boxes and it was basically truck to trunk. Now, it's great to get all of that food out to the many food insecure people whose jobs suddenly evaporated when the pandemic hit. But there is also a trade-off because when it comes to food, one size does not fit all. The <clears throat> Hyde Park Kenwood Food Pantry and also St. Paul and the, and the Redeemer did not go to this model. For one thing, most of our um, recipients don't have cars. For another thing, Hyde Park Union Church doesn't have a parking lot. Were we going to park the big trucks in the middle of Woodlawn Avenue? I don't think so. And also, we're very interested, especially at a time of a pandemic, in getting food that people actually want to eat. Part of the problem with the um, boxes of protein were that they all contained pork. And I've discovered over the, the last couple of years that a third to half of the folks who come would prefer not to eat pork or do not eat it at all. So we were not interested in getting food that would alienate people, especially if they have to carry it home. You don't want people to carry home food they don't want. So what we have done is um, before the food pantry session starts, the day before, we prepack bags of non-perishable food. And we have different kinds of bags with different things in it. <clears throat> and we also have bags of fresh produce so that people can say, oh, I want your spaghetti bag, but take out the chicken noodle soup or, and I don't want the tomato soup either. Or they can say, well, I want um, the onion and potato bag, but I have enough onions. Could I have extra potatoes? So we've tried to do as much of a client sort, uh, choice model of food as we can. And <clears throat> this was so difficult because although during the pandemic, we're getting all of our food from the food depository completely free, not just the government food, but all the food, there is less of it available, much less of it available. So the High Park Kenwood Food Pantry has used the donations from the community, um, the financial donations, to purchase peanut butter when we need it, or spaghetti, or rice, things that, that people want that are um, comfort food, as well as fresh produce. We're partnering also with the um, 62nd and Dorchester Community Garden during the growing season. They bring fresh produce from the garden that the individual gardeners have donated to the food pantry. And it's bagged up, ready to go. We put it on the menu so that if people want kale, they can have it. And right now, red tomatoes. Have we got tomatoes? And people can have 
red tomatoes if they want it. We've got people who actually know what purslane is and want it, and we can give it to them. So we're very, very grateful um, to anyone who's thrown a dollar or two our way because this um, financial security for the food pantry has allowed us to buy food that people actually want to eat. Uh, we're also very interested in um, giving people access to other resources. So we've had the U.S. Census Bureau come out to tell people how to get employed by the census. We were um, purveyors of the um, spring quarter free grab and go meals from the University of Chicago. Every Saturday we gave out over 400 grab and grow, go breakfasts and lunches provided by the university, along with milk and water. Um, I don't know if their program will continue past the summer. We weren't part of the summer program because they shifted their um, focus to local uh, caterers rather than their own uh, food service people. And they also shifted locations from food pantries for the most part to senior buildings to make sure that seniors were provided with um, attractive and nutritious meals. Um, we've also uh, are interested in joining the food depositories program to uh, get out the vote. So for the first time, we will be allowed to do voter registration um, information at the food pantry. We haven't been allowed to do that before because of the separation of, of political activity and food pantries that give out government food. But um, we're gonna figure out how we can finesse that and get out the vote. And we'll, we're also going to be in, uh, encouraging people who for whatever reason have not responded to the census to fill out census forms either online or on paper. We've um, been very interested in um, where the folks coming to the food pantry have been coming from. Our numbers exploded during um, April and May, and we had people coming from far away neighborhoods, Archer Heights, Brighton Park, um, South Shore, South Chicago, even Hagwish, which are all food deserts, according to the, the maps that our previous speaker provided. So people are, are very much interested in getting food that they want. And these folks came to us because they had friends or relatives in the, the area who came to our pantry and recommended um, what we give to, to their friends and family members. During uh, July and the end of June, we noticed that we were not getting quite the numbers that we had gotten before. You know, our, our numbers doubled right off the bat in April and, and May. But as the state has opened up and people have gone back to work, I think that accounts for um, the slight decrease in numbers. Because really, who wants who wants to come to a food pantry if you don't have to? Who wants to um, answer the uh, questions that we're required to ask? And one of the questions that the state requires us to ask is if people receive SNAP. And most of the people who are coming to the food pantry now do not receive SNAP. They're there were a number of SNAP families who got increased benefits because they have children. But on the other hand, um, you can't receive SNAP if you're not a US citizen. Um, that is, that is um, entirely impossible. So we've, we've had a number of uh, people come to us uh, who just had nowhere else to go. And we have um, 
recommended them to other pantries as well, closer to where they stay. On the other hand, we're open on Saturdays. And so people who are working during the week, it's harder for them to go to food pantries. I'm sorry, um, Byron, I can't hear you if you're asking a question. Sorry. Yeah, I was asking, uh, did you have more for us uh, from the food pantry? Well, I, I, think, I think it would be good to um, respond to questions. But before that, I'll say we belong to the Food Depository's uh, produ produce van program, which means twice a month, in addition to our monthly delivery from the Food Depository, the van pulls up and out comes produce that is a surprise. We have no idea what it's going to be. And sometimes it's a surprise to our recipients. They don't know spaghetti squash. They haven't really cooked with cauliflower. So when we have um, produce items that may not be familiar to the folks who come, we also provide them with recipes that don't take um, exotic ingredients but just sort of the basics. What do you do to a beet if it's, you know, out of the ground as opposed to out of a jar? All right, very good, Jan. Uh, other speaker, and I'm sure we're gonna have questions for you later though. Okay. So thank you. thank you. Our next speaker is uh, Connie Spring. Connie is from Experimental Station. And Connie, tell us about your work with Experimental Station and food security. Hi, and thank you again for, um, for allowing me to speak tonight. Um, my experience and Experimental Station's experience with uh, dealing with food insecurity actually comes from our first experience of 20 years of living in Woodlawn. Um, we lived there and kind of struggled always to figure out ways of getting healthy food in the neighborhood and started a community garden and I started a buying club, uh, food buying club and found a farmer who was willing to bring chickens and eggs to us on a monthly basis. And there were a group of us who got involved in that. And um, there were just, you know, we were always kind of trying to figure out ourselves how to bring food um, to ourselves and to our neighbors. And uh, it was very clear that there was a food access problem in uh, Woodlawn at the time. And we were just living on 61st street and uh, had, started the, the garden over at um, uh, the corner of 61st and Dorchester. And so in 2005 and 2006 decided that once we had started Experimental Station that it would maybe be a good idea to start a farmer's market. And I'd spent, my family had spent a lot of time in Europe where the farmer's markets were prevalent and wonderful. And we thought, what if we brought this community amenity to the neighborhood? You know, what would that mean? And um, from the beginning, we wanted the food that was going to be sold there to be sustainably raised because we thought if we eat organic and sustainably raised food at home, um, I wouldn't want to feed that anything but that quality to our community. And so we launched the market in 2008. And from the first day, that was a question that arose was how do you enable low income folks to purchase this higher priced food? And we um, first discussed it as being a question of education and talked for a long time about that. And you know, through our market school and through chef demonstrations and a variety of other ways to teach folks about the difference between the very fresh foods that were be, being sold at the farmer's market and the foods that they would purchase at the grocery store. You know, what was that difference? And they were completely different types of products, even though they looked the same in terms of, of quality and in terms of nutritional value. But that, you know, question remained for the next year until 2009, when we started a program called the um, Double Value Coupon Program and launched that in Illinois, our market, the 61st Street Farmers Market was the first market to do that. And um, it moved us from just making food available. And so this was part of our very long learning process of 
what it means to provide food access and what it means to um, address food insecurity in our neighborhood. And we discovered the degree to which it was a multi-dimensional problem. And what we had done at first was made food available and that was not enough. And then we had made it, and from the beginning, we'd had made it accessible to our SNAP um, recipient neighbors by accepting SNAP from the beginning. But even accepting SNAP was not enough. Um, and so then in 2009, uh, figured out this wonderful way of making it affordable. And so we continue to do that to this day. Um, we, I had applied for a grant to the Wholesome Wave Foundation out on the East Coast and overnight wrote the grant. The next day they gave us the money and two weeks later we started the program where we match SNAP purchases at our farmer's market um, up to $25 per market day. So that has enabled us to like address this problem of affordability at the market. And um, the success of that program, which was immediate, um, the response that we received from, from the folks who took advantage of it was um, really positive to the extent that, and now we've done it for years and years, we're in our 13th year of the market. Um, we've had people from, because I'll explain a little more, but we've had people all over the state um, in tears saying that this is so helpful to them to have the access to these very healthy foods, locally grown, sustainably grown in many cases, um, fruits, vegetables, and other, other foods at an affordable price. But one of, the, one of the issues that has been already brought up that we've also faced is just desirability. That's also a part of um, addressing food insecurity. You can make it available and accessible and affordable, but you also have to make it desirable. And so, you know, somebody gets a spaghetti squash and they don't know what that yellow thing is. Um, you have to help them to figure it out. And you also have to work with your farmers. If you're running a farmer's market like we are, um, you work with your farmers to plant foods that people in your community actually want and know how to use. So we've done that um, over the years on the farmer side, but we've also on the other side um, done a lot of work around food education. So we, we you know, are trying to address what those, what those fruits and vegetables might be, why you might want to eat it, how to prepare it, you know, what does it taste like? Um, in some cases, how to grow it. We work a lot with the Carnegie School next door over at uh, 61st and Dorchester, the second, third and fourth graders and teaching them what it means to eat healthfully, what it means you know, to um, where food comes from, how to grow it and um, also what it tastes like. And in addition, we work with the Jackson Park Terrace Apartments over on Stony Island and um, help food people there to grow their own food, as well as um, we provide food every Saturday through harvest days to the residents, whoever would like to have the food that we're growing there. But there's, there's a lot of work that needs to happen, um, you know, in all of these different ways and ways that other presenters have already kind of um, laid out and that, that there are so many dimensions to it that you can't think of it as a simple problem. It's a complex problem that demands a variety of solutions and different solutions in different places and at different times. So with COVID, you know, our farmer's market, we were not allowed to start the market by the city of Chicago. It's permitted by the city. And until June, um, they were not allowing us or any markets to operate. So we were stuck trying to figure out what to do to help our low income population gain access to food. Other people could go to the store more easily because we had easier access to the grocery store. Other people could go online and order food online. You can't use SNAP online to purchase food. And so our SNAP folks, you know, were, you know, truly in a state of crisis, um, not knowing how to gain access to food. And I'm sure some of you experienced it as well, you know, going into our local stores and seeing that they, all the shelves are empty. I'd never seen that before. And to see that was, was really kind of terrifying. Um, 
and just realizing that, you know, the degree to which we are food insecure, you know, all of us, but that we have folks around us who experience a kind of food insecurity like that all the time. And so the fact that, that SNAP recipients were not able to use their SNAP to purchase food, um, even online when they couldn't even get it at the grocery store, um, was a real problem. So we created for this summer a uh, what we call market boxes, and it's partnering with Star Farm in back of the yards and some other farmers that um, are helping to aggregate some of their product and working with Invisible Institute, who's also at Experimental Station and Build Coffee. And we've created this market box initiative where we're getting, we're purchasing um, every week 200 boxes that we are providing to uh, 400 families. So every other week, 200 families receive a box of vegetables, a dozen eggs and bread from the public and bakery. So um, it's been very successful this summer. So far we've had wonderful um, donations to enable us to carry that out over the course of this summer. There may be, now that COVID is lasting longer, we're afraid we may have to go you know, longer um, and we're in the process of figuring that out. Um, but in the course of doing all of this stuff, we realized that um, other markets wanted to do what we were doing and the city of Chicago wanted to do some of the things that we were doing. So since 2010, we've provided for the city of Chicago, um, this SNAP service for the city and also this doubling of SNAP benefits or link benefits at the farmer's market. And that since 2010 has grown into a program we call Link Up Illinois. And um, through Link Up Illinois, we actually fund and train and provide technical support to farmers markets all over the state of Illinois. So in 20, 2019, the last good year we had, um, we uh, provided funding to over 100 uh, farmers markets around the state, as well as um, four food cooperatives, which we've moved into in the last couple of years. And uh, this summer are entering and providing link match, we call it, um, in grocery stores uh, or corner stores in Englewood. And we just got some big funding from the federal government. So we'll be moving into um, grocery stores in the South and West sides uh, beginning this fall. And for us, what's really important about that is, you know, seeing what's happening under COVID, um, just the uh, difficulty of low income folks to be able to gain access to healthy food and fruits and vegetables in particular um, is ongoing. And so by moving into corner stores and by moving into uh, grocery stores, we'll be able to enable them to use their, their snapper link in these stores over the course of the months when there will not be farmer's markets. And so we're, we're trying to build the capacity across both in Chicago, but eventually across the state for um, grocery stores to be able to match these SNAP link purchases um, as well. So it's kind of an exciting time for us. COVID has exploded our work um, in a way that I swore I would never do. I said my job was not going to ever be to try to solve the food, the food crisis in the state of Illinois, but it just has turned out that that's the direction we have ended up going in. Um, and uh, we're now working with the Illinois Department of Human Services to provide grants to farmers of color um, to be able to expand their food production. And so it's, they're able to purchase equipment and infrastructure, um, significant money for them. And this is going to happen in the next month. So um, this will enable us also to help folks on the south and west sides of Chicago. So part of the commitment these farmers will have to make in receiving the funds that we give them will be to help provide um, food, produce in particular, to the um, both WIC centers on the south and west sides and uh, farmers markets. So we're excited about that. Um, it's, a, it's a very positive response to the COVID crisis. So I'll stop there. Okay. Thank you, Connie. That was very interesting information. Uh, we're going to move along. Uh, we're we're going to ask some questions of uh, our speakers as they kind of come in. 
Ali, have you got one to start with, or should I go ahead from the chat? Or um, well, we first let's make sure we have. Okay, we have uh, uh, Umahara and Jen. Um, thank you all for being with us. Um, I'm we're going to say that uh, we are opening up to Q and A. We we have some questions already um, that have been submitted, um, and then um, if you would like to, uh, you know ask your question via the chat, please put it in the chat. If you wanna ask your question live, um, then please raise your hand. I see um, uh, Philinda has raised her hand. So we'll take one of our questions um, online that was asked in the Q&A, um, and then we'll go back and forth uh, for those who raised their hands, all right? So um, we received um, from, from somebody in the audience, um, anonymous, is there any centralized list of food pantries and resources in our community um, that lists status and how we can contribute as community members, whether that's food or cash or good donation, or even if it's physically volunteer, um, volunteering? So um, is there like a centralized list? Um, and the person asked, they would also like to know whether there's any local programs in place to attend community meals uh, where we serve those in need. Yes, um, <clears throat> if you don't mind, I'll take that. Please, yes. The, um, the Greater Chicago Food Depository keeps a list of all of its member agencies, food pantries, um, mass feedings like soup kitchens, and also shelters that um, feed people. And um, you can find them at their website, which is chicagosfoodbank.org. And you can plug in a zip code and you'll find the agencies that serve that zip code. You'll also find contact information for the people involved in those agencies. And so that is your uh, cue then to contact the people who you would like to deal with and find out what they actually need. You have to consider that not, that food pantries aren't grocery stores. We don't have aisles and aisles of refrigeration available. So the timing, especially of fresh produce is extremely important. And you also don't know, unless you've been to the food pantry, how much storage they have. And also in these days, um, we're, we're just accepting food that comes in cases from the producer or from the manufacturer. We're not accepting food that comes from individuals' kitchens, for example, because the, we're very concerned about food safety. A lot of the people who come to us for food are immunocompromised, and we know that uh, um, man, the Greater Chicago Food Depository, they have a food safety manager. Um, we know how food is handled with our partners at the 62nd and Dorchester Community Garden. So we know where the food is come, has come from and we know how it's been stored. So it's, it's very important to talk to the target agency to find out what they need and also the timing. Thank you, Jen. Um, and okay, so now why don't we go to, um, we have uh, Philinda um, who has raised her hand and wants to ask a question. Let's see if we can get Philinda on. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, Philinda. Okay, my question is to Connie. Um, as a small farmer, a small grower, can you provide any information to smaller farmers, locally, locally grown, who can apply for the grant so that they can help provide food for people in the community to Chicago area, fresh produce? Is that something, can you provide some link or some way to get involved? Yes, go to, 
experimentalstation.org. And if you look at the top of our website, there's a band that talks about the fresh food from farmers of color fund, I think is the last word. Okay. Um, okay. Go there and click on that and um, yeah, supply. Okay, thank you. There, there are other entities in uh, Illinois that have received some funding from various sources to, to um, support local farming or for farmers in Illinois who are growing food. Um, it turns out that the funding that we have is the biggest. So it came out of the um, a million dollars that, that uh, Governor Pritzker put forward for farmers markets in early July or late June. And um, so it, it needs to be spent fast. And, um, okay. <laughs> so, so please, yes, do apply. And if you know other farmers of color who are interested in applying, please encourage them. Okay. And I just want to say that I do appreciate that you have said this evening and thank you for your input. You're welcome. Thank you, Philinda. You're welcome. All right, we have um, another question uh, from one of our audience members um, in the Q&A. Um, does anyone have any idea how to address that elsewhere in Illinois outside of Chicago? Um, can we use SNAP for online purchasing? Um, in Illinois, you cannot yet use SNAP for online purchasing, except for they, they're approving it for Amazon and Whole Foods. So um, those were the, I'm sorry, not Whole Foods, for Walmart, Amazon and Walmart. And they had been, the USDA had been doing a pilot with Amazon and Walmart in the past. And um, they were able to more easily apply that to Illinois. Um, so, so it hasn't been extended yet, but they are trying to work on that. So as of now, they can use Snap for for Amazon and Walmart online in Illinois. That's my understanding. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, um, and we are still taking questions. Um, so we have one um, other uh, in the chat, and then we'll get to someone who's raised their hand. So we have a question from uh, Dorothy Strang. Um, it says the 61st farmers market includes quite a few urban farm enterprises. How can the market highlight these wonderful local assets? I guess that's for Connie. <laughs> um, well, for, well for, for, for anyone and, and feel free, you know, um, you know, please Connie start us off, but for everyone else, feel free to jump in um, and uh, you know, we can make this a conversation if we need to. Well, we do, we do what we can to, to um, promote both the urban farmers, but also all of the farmers. Um, to be honest, it's hard to promote certain farmers over other farmers ourselves. And so it's, it's helpful to have other people helping to promote them as well. All right, thank you, Connie. Um, okay, let's, we, we'll, we'll move to um, our, one of our attendees, Linda Swift was with us we're going to allow you to talk okay can you hi. hear me we can hear you linda hi good Welcome. so i hope it's appropriate for me to put this in at this point in the meeting it's not quite a question but i am involved with the kenwood food project which we developed at the beginning of the pandemic to try to help restaurant restaurant workers in our area and also to help families of students at Kenwood Academy who may be suffering from food insecurity. So what we do is we have five cooperate, at this point we have five cooperating restaurants and they are the Medici Pizza Capri, B Gabs, which is vegetarian on 57th Street, Cedars in the Kimbark Shopping Plaza and also Cafe 53. And then we have two grocery stores, Hyde Park Produce and food and paper supply, which is at 72nd and South Chicago Avenue. So <clears throat> we may be trying to expand our grocery store cooperators, uh, but that hasn't been accomplished yet. Um, so at this point, if you would like to give 
and help this project, you can go to the Kenwood Food Project's Facebook page, or we actually give through the Hyde Park Neighborhood Club and they act as our fiduciary agent and would send you a charitable receipt for your contribution. But also, most importantly for this meeting, I think I want to say that if you have a student at Kenwood Academy and your family is in need of food, please contact either call an administrator or contact your child's counselor and say that you understand there's something called the Kenwood Food Project. They currently have 47 $50 gift cards for one of these restaurants or grocery stores that they are giving out to people. But as you know, the kids aren't going to school and not very many parents are at school these days. So it's been a little slow going during the summer, but things are picking up now and, and more people are going in. So if you know of people who have kids at Kenwood and would like to benefit from this program, they just need to, they, they can certainly email me swiftimages at gmail.com and I can give your contact information to the school, but it's really best if you go straight to the school because they're the ones who are confirming that people have a student at Kenwood and are giving out the gift cards. So thank you very much for giving me a little time. Thank you so much, Linda. That was really, really beneficial and useful information. Um, right. and, and yes, please everyone keep that in mind. Um, it is definitely a resource. And if you know someone at Kenwood, please pass this information along. So thank you, Linda. You're welcome, thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, we have a few more questions. Um, I, I had a question though, um, and I wanted to ask, you know, uh, Yumahara, you talked about food sovereignty. Um, and, you know, I, 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 I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about how, how do you think we as a community, you know, can uh, build food sovereignty in our neighborhoods, you know, within Hyde Park, Kenwood, um, you know, but even even the surrounding areas like Woodlawn, um, you know, even getting into North Kenwood and Bronzeville, um, how, how can we do that as a community? That's a really good question. I believe that the key of like realizing food sovereignty is to continue organizing. Uh, I have heard tonight Jan and Connie and like how many achievements they've had even during the pandemic and like how they have been able to contribute to the resilience of our communities. And I think the key is in organizing and recognizing that uh, no one should go to bed hungry, no matter what situation they are in. They just shouldn't be like that. Uh, we're all human beings and if we place the community at the center of the decision making, we really can achieve many big things. Uh, Connie's and Jan's stories are like very inspiring because they are telling us how they started alone and how they were building community along the time. So, uh, well, I don't have all the answers for on how we can start projects. Uh, I'm willing to like start one if, if like someone reaches out to me, we can start organizing and think of ways to improve the food system. You know, like we can contribute to Connie's and Jan's projects. And like they say, build like many different multidimensional approaches. As Jan said, like one size does not fit all. Many people have different preferences, different cultural needs. And we just need to understand that and build on that uh fact you know different the fact that we accept our differences is what is going to make us stronger so let's just keep organizing thank you yeah that's and we can and i and um we also uh put in the chat that um hpkcc is planning on forming a working group on food security um and so for those who are interested we would love um all of us, in, in, including our panelists, um, if you're interested in participating, we would love your help and support. And you can email communications at hydepark.org if you're interested in participating in this working group. Um, so I think we have another question that was in the chat um, from Maureen Graves. 
Um, it's a very, very interesting question. A question I've often wondered is how feasible is year round growing in Chicago? Um, and what are plans for addressing pandemic related food insecurity during the fall and winter months? And I'll open it up. Um, I, I can I can speak to the growing because of the farmers market um, the experience I've had. Uh, it is difficult to grow year round in this area. Um, what tends to happen is that um, farmers have built uh, hoop houses or other types of structures that allow them to extend their seasons. So they are they can extend their season which would normally end sometime in October, they can extend it into December and then they can pick it up earlier in the spring. So beginning to have some sort of, you know, greens and various products, um, sometimes throughout the winter, uh, but definitely in March and April and, and um, on to the rest of the year. But it doesn't fill all of the needs. And so there are root crops that they can save, you know, and they can, conserved throughout the course of the winter. So there are lots of root crops, but in terms of the greens, um, it's more difficult to do so. And the root crops are there because they harvested them in the fall. It's not as if they have harvested them in January. All right, thank you, Connie. Um, now, I think that we, does any, we have another question. Oh, and uh, Philinda um, has another question for us. We can, I'm going to put you on file, Linda. Okay, can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, um, Miss Yumahara, forgive me if I didn't pronounce your name right. Oh, no Food sovereignty. Right. Okay, good. Food sovereignty and growing your own. Are you familiar with any gardens or community gardens that are growing somewhat um, food sources that are not normally available in this area? As far as culture, where are you familiar with? any of those and people that may want to share their different culture growings? That's actually a very good question. I'm not like, uh, I have recently moved to Woodland and I'm starting to like explore more my neighborhood. Um, but what I can tell from my, what I have experienced, I am a very frequent customer of the 63rd uh, market, the, uh, the farmer's market that Connie runs in the experimental station, is that I have seen okay. there a lot of like different crops that I was not aware that they even exist. Coming from different producers that um, I believe they are either in the region or like in like states that are close to like the Chicago area. So um, that has been very interesting for me in terms of trying like different nutritious foods. Uh, but I believe that what you're mentioning is a great idea. And uh, you know, we could uh, build on the difference that I mentioned uh, before and just like uh, share what is culturally relevant to each one of us. Uh, and maybe you start a gardening project where you're mentioning it's uh, totally a, a good idea and uh, I would be up for doing something like that. I don't know if Connie and Jan that like have experience uh, more and have lived in this area for longer have uh, any other information in regards to these um, urban farming projects? There are there are community gardens. Okay. One that you're probably familiar with. Um, I wouldn't call them urban farms. They are individuals who have, you know, 10 by 10 or 10 by 20 plots. Um, but uh, there are a number of places in the Woodlawn uh, area where you can definitely um, get a plot and grow your own food or some part of your own food. I've got a question um, for Jan. Can I jump in? Yeah. Okay, Jan, 
what is the difference between a food pantry and a food bank? Um, I will answer that, but first I wanted to um, finish with Ms. Wiley. Um, Erica, um, a resource for you is might be Erica Allen, who is with the Urban Growers Collective. And she has a farm down in South Chicago, and she knows so many of the urban farmers that she might be somebody to talk to. And her email is Erica, E-R-I-K-A, um, at urbangrowerscollective.org. Um, so, so then I'll, I'll get back to your question about the difference between a food pantry and a food bank. And people tend to use them interchangeably, but a food bank is like the Greater Chicago Food Depository that um, supplies food to smaller agencies that are more like food pantries. Um, but really a lot of people use them interchangeably. When I think of food banks, I think of the Greater Chicago Food Depository. And when I think of a food pantry, I think of the smaller agencies that give to individuals as opposed to giving to other agencies. Okay, I thought there was a difference, but people use the terms interchangeably all the time. Okay. So they let's do. clarify that, yes, all right. All right. Um, okay, so we're gonna uh, make one last round or one last call for questions um, before we wrap up for the evening. Um, does anyone else from our audience members have any questions? They can put them in the chat now or raise your hand. All right, so it looks like um, uh, we are gonna wrap up for the evening. Um, I wanna personally thank all of our participants um, and our elected official, Senator Peters. Um, it has been my pleasure to um, be co-hosting and co-emceeing tonight. Um, and I would like to just hand it off to Phi Lin, um, who will close us out for the evening. Thank you, Ali. Uh, and I too wanna to thank our uh, participants and our guests for the evening and thank our audience for the evening. Uh, we'd like to especially thank uh, Senator Robert Peters uh, and our guest speakers, uh, HPKCC member Yura Mahama Garcia, Jan Deckenbach from the Hyde Park Food Pantry and Connie Spring from Experimental Station. And as always, we'd like you to please help us further our mission in the community. Join, volunteer and donate at hydepark.org. Thank you and good night. Good night, everyone. Good night.